Before we get to the movie, I want to talk about my least favorite scene in Steven Spielberg's Duel. A movie I still haven't seen. I don't know what you're waiting for. It's I good. I don't know either. You know who's a pretty good director? Steven Spielberg. Even for this, his first movie. Yeah, a TV movie. It's supposed to be amazing. Yeah, it's basically Jaws with a truck instead mm -hmm. of a shark. For those of you who don't know, Dennis Weaver, the most nervous man to ever walk God's green earth, is menaced by this monster truck. And so the truck is like a force of nature. Now, there's one scene where he comes up behind the truck and they're stopped at a thing. And a hand comes out of the truck and waves him around. Mm -hmm. That bummed me out so much. There's a human driver in this oh. monstrous machine. I can see that he's a white guy. Mm -hmm. I can tell his relative weight and age just by seeing his hand. He's wearing a wristwatch. Mm -hmm. For me, it just took away a lot of the magic and the menace of it. He's being chased around by someone who could be my dad. Yeah. It's old Vern, the truck driver. Yeah. <laughs> he always does this route. You being chased by him? Oh, yeah. That's Vern. I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. It might be good. It might be bad. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to the basement. Happy Halloween, folks. Uh, it's one of our favorite holidays here in the basement, and I have a scary movie for us to watch. And tonight, I'm going to take you to a scary house. Really? Yes. The House of the Long Shadows. <laughs> Didn't we just get this movie? We just got that movie. It's fresh off the presses. All right. Released in 1983, H-O-T-L-S stars Basement alums Peter Cushing, Vincent Price, John Carradine, and for his ninth appearance on our show, Christopher, Christopher Lee. Lee. It was directed by Pete Walker, and the script was based on the 1913 novel Seven Keys to Baldpate by Earl Durr Biggers and the play adaptation of the same novel by George M. Cohan. This is the seventh film adaptation of that story. The movie was produced by Canon Pictures and Basement alum Menachem Golan. Ugh, that guy. I tried to watch this movie the other night. I wanted a scary movie that wasn't too scary. I put this in. I watched 10 minutes of it, and I stopped it. I said, nope, this is going on the show. <laughs> Your gift tonight is a little something to help you celebrate Halloween. All right. Ooh, Halloween scene flashlight. Look at that. You can project scary things on the wall. Yeah, you take off these little discs, you put them on the tip there. And you can make long shadows. You can. Of a witch, of bats, popular in our house. The bats are popular on this show. Yeah. <laughs> it's raining. Get the car off that muddy road and pull up uh, next to the old leather couch where we're going to be having a cozy evening watching the House of the Long Shadows. <laughs> what? <laughs> Do something! I'm scared already. Kenneth McGee is an American author in London. To do a book tour. He meets up with his publisher, Sam. I'm sure it'll still earn us all a great deal of money. That's all that matters. The camera hates him. It really does. That's quite a sign they made for him. Is that real poster board? <laughs> Kenneth runs into this blonde lady and they have a little brief connection. She almost must my perfectly feathered hair. Oh, falling in love is very realistic. People do it all the time. Not in my novels, they don't. I don't believe in it. His dialogue hates him. I just, when he speaks it out of his mouth, you can, you can feel the words fleeing as fast as they can go. Sam is lamenting the lack of classical authors these days. Where are all the Charles Dickenses and the Wuthering Heights lady? I mean, anyone can write one of those things. It's just a question of letting your imagination go bananas. That's why I'm going to write a book called Wuthering Bananas. Why I could write a novel as good as Wuthering Heights in one night. $10,000, I'll bet you. Kenneth, I really... $20,000. Sam takes the bet. Three o'clock Saturday afternoon? I'll be here. Look, his wardrobe hates him. Look at that suit. I'll need this old house to write it in. I have this place in Wales that has an impronounceable name. We just call it... Baldpate Manor. Kenneth is driving through the rainy Welsh countryside. He stops at a train station to try and get directions. He meets a couple of English tourists. We've been sitting here in this filthy dump since 4.30 this afternoon. Rather. There's this creepy old woman who comes in. Excuse me, uh... Crone. <laughs> she goes into the ladies' room. They open the door, and the old lady is run off. 
The train master is there. He says, what are you doing here? Well, I'm looking for Baldpate Manor. No one goes to Baldpate Manor. It's a cursed place. But here's how you get there. You go down to the road, you take a left. Balpato Manor will find you in its own good time. Oh, well, I'll just stay here then. <laughs> Kenneth drives through the rain and he finds the big old house. And he wanders around. It's all, it's so spooky. He walks from room to room looking at things. Wouldn't it be weird if he just did this for the next 20 minutes? Just wandered from room to room, noting the length of the shadows. <laughs> And all these drop cloths. Things just left behind when the house was abandoned. He does a lot of time exploring silently. Nah, not worth it. This will be a good place for me to write a novel by dawn. All right, chapter one. A dumb man makes a foolish bet. Midnight Manor is going to be the title of his book. But he notices something weird about the room. Oh yeah, you like that clock? Yeah? You like that, don't you? There's no dust in the place. There's fresh water in the thing. There are fresh sheets upon the bed. Time to do some more wandering. <laughs> Jump scare? Where are you? There you are! What are you doing here? The caretakers! Victoria and Elijah Quimby. They don't know why Kenneth is here, and they don't like it. Kenneth sees that old lady, and he goes and grabs her. <laughs> it's the blonde lady he ran into. Please, Mr. McGee, you're in grave danger. And she talks to him about terrorism, and she makes up these stories, and Kenneth doesn't believe any of it. Hey, I got a book to write. Why don't you skedaddle? He hears her talking on the phone to Sam, his publisher. She was there to distract him so he couldn't write his book. There are no caretakers? Huh? No one's supposed to be there. I don't know who those two people are. So she goes back up and tells Kenneth that. Well, who are you, really? Some secretary. Mary Norton. Secretary. Uh, you're not a real English woman, lady. You could always uh, call by in the morning, collect me. Maybe we could have breakfast together. Yeah. When I'm done with this novel. I'm two lines into it. And I got the best title ever. Midnight Manor. That's M-A-N-O-R. Not a way that one acts, but a large country building. My midnight manner is to put on pajamas and go to sleep. <laughs> Someone else shows up. Who are you? It's Sebastian Rand. I was um, driving through this fearsome storm when my automobile fell into a state of disrepair. Would you care for a glass of hot punch? Uh, no, thank you. I'd prefer a punch in the face. I'm freaky like that. Punch. I could go for some punch. Right now I have a punch in a long time. Want some punch. You make the expression of great thought and great emotion. Cushing's been wanting to do this voice for 50 years. Yep, Lucas wouldn't let him do it. <laughs> the Death Star will be fully operational. <laughs> Look! Willie Loman's come home! <laughs> I have returned. Lionel Grisbane arrives. Now there's nothing but the stench of decay. It smells like the funk of 40,000 years in here. I can offer you some hot punch. <laughs> what's going on here? I want to know what's going on here. <laughs> I came here for isolation. Instead, it's like I've gatecrashed the social event of the year. <laughs> Good one, me. This is my ancestral home. Does that seem so extraordinary to you, Mr. McGee? Or is... Sentiment not a part of your emotional vocabulary. I'm sorry, I wasn't following that at all. You're using a lot of big words, and as a writer, I don't know them. Kenneth doesn't have time for this. He's got a book to write. He and Mary go upstairs. Kenneth gets back to work. R, 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 R. <laughs> Do you hear that? It sounds like a clickety clack. What must it be? They smell something cooking. They're going to go get something to eat. Portraits have been discovered. They're portraits of those weirdos downstairs, and they all have the same last name, Grisbane. It's Sebastian Grisbane, Qu Quimby Grisbane, or whoever. This is all one family. What's going on in this house? There's another visitor. His name is Corrigan. Would somebody be good enough to tell me just exactly what is going on, please? And for God's sake, will someone serve me a glass of punch? May I offer you some punch? Thank you. This is his house. He is buying it. You are all trespassing. 
No, this is our ancestral manor. Our heritage died long ago. Died in shame, sir. Unspeakable shame. I probably shouldn't be speaking of it since it's unspeakable, but, well, I'm confused. I'm an old man. We lost it years ago because of the disgrace that our brother, Roderick, brought on the family. Roderick! So please let us stay, Mr. Corgan. It's only one night. Corgan's like, okay, whatever. They have a little party. Oh, Peter Cushing has a beautiful voice. Yes. The old lady sings a song. It was always our tradition. To bring down the room with some dour tunes. You will join us for dinner, won't you? It's all mash and no bangers, I'm afraid. But it's something. They have dinner. (sighs) Corrigan says, okay, this is getting a little out of hand. I think you guys should leave. And they say, no, we cannot leave before midnight. Something special is happening at midnight, for you see. Roderick is still alive. He's been locked upstairs in a room for 40 years as punishment for disgracing the family. And tonight, we set him free! They go up to the door. It's this dusty old locked door. They all go in there. And it's filled with creepy and crazy. That's a reaction. Look at you reacting. Roderick has surely turned into a monster with scratchy fingers. Roderick has escaped. Whoa! That is the corpse of a village girl from back in the day who he got pregnant and then he murdered her. That is the kind of 14-year-old boy that we sentenced to imprisonment. We've all been 14. Shouldn't somebody be going to find a doctor? Get the cops out looking for your brother? Shouldn't somebody be upstairs writing a novel? It's time to leave. Let's get out of here. But his tires have been slashed up. No doubt by that madman fiend, Roderick. Kenneth goes to his car and sees that it's all wrecked. It would seem, Mr. McGee, that we are in prison here. Ah! Roderick has struck again. Remember that young couple from the train station? Well, the movie does. They've been wandering around out in the rain. This is Diana and Andrew. Oh, I'm an artist. Well, I'm still struggling. I've had an exhibition. Uh, not really an exhibition. I'm really more of an exhibition. I, I took my penis out in public. But it's not a test to me. It's made quite exhibitionist-y. He's a typical suffering artist. He spends all his time being artistic, while everyone else has to suffer for it. Ding dong, punchline. One more good one for Diana. And now I'll have some more punch. Speaking of punch, I'd like to do that to my husband Andrew, who I don't like very much. Ding dong, two more for Diana. Wait, who's playing that piano? Victoria? Victoria ain't. Wait. Where's Victoria? Wait. There's Victoria. Wait. She's dead! Strangled by piano wire. Diana and Andrew get in a fight outside. And I've had enough of you! I need to go wash my face. Go up to my room. There's a big vat of water in my room. That ain't water. It's acid. And it burns her face right up! Now she dead. Andrew, inconsolable, is offered a glass of wine. It's poisoned. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Andrew's dead. We gotta take out Roderick. It's us against him. We can do it. Well, where should we go? Where should we go? I I don't know. I wish someone would tell me. Try and flush him out. Uh, where to go? <laughs> they wander through the secret tunnels because this is surely how he's getting around. Sebastian has been hung, hanged, hinged. Finally, it comes out. Corrigan is not Corrigan. Brother. G-goink. He's Roderick. Aha! Come to take his revenge. Particularly on Lionel, who really was the one who impregnated that village girl and murdered her, and he framed Roderick for it. Roderick takes that axe. Yeah, get him. Get him with the glaive. Get him with the the halberd. Or what is that? Could just be an axe. Got a glaive and exacts his revenge. Choppity chop. Give him 40 wax. Oh yeah, him. (laughs) Mary sees all of this. He's got to take her out too. He's climbing up the stairs. She's crawling up the stairs. There's Kenneth to the rescue. They fight. You can't kill Christopher Lee. He'll just come back later. Kenneth is seemingly killed. 
But you know we're not going to get that lucky. Roderick raises the axe. Kenneth comes back to life. Kaya! Kicks him down the stairs. Tumble, tumble, tumble. He gets an axe in the midriff. Rock and roll! <laughs> Turns out it was all a ruse after all. That's right. Sam spent $20,000 hiring all these <clears throat> actors and renting this house so he could steal your $20,000. Sam arranged the whole thing. They all go to a party. Do you like some more champagne? Uh, thank you, my dear. Would you like some more sham? <laughs> oh well, no hard feelings, Sam. I've learned a lesson. That a lesson is something. Personal emotions really are more. Are bigger than anything. What? Suddenly we see Kenneth finishing his novel. How could he possibly have... Wait a minute. Everything we just saw was his novel. That's the story. Ah, character growth. That's what that is. That, that's, that's character growth. Sam writes him a check for $20,000 and he tears it up because of reasons. And now I'm going to be rich because I wrote the book Midnight Manor. And to think, it all happened in that house of long shadows. Desi Arnaz Jr., what the hell is going on there? What other actor wasn't available. Every other actor. You could have got Tony Danza in that role and it would have been better. How do you come from those genes? Desi Arnaz and Lucille Ball, two of the greatest all-around entertainers of all time, mm -hmm. and you get that. Yeah, he didn't camp it up. He didn't try to play it serious. He didn't try to play it funny. He just did nothing. Yeah. Talk about cutting the jugular vein of the movie right off the bat. Like, mm -hmm. nothing's gonna happen there. And yeah. you have these four brilliant actors, and they're doing their best. Peter Cushing's final monologue before he's hanged is a beautiful little moment. It's a terrible thing, you know, living one's entire life in a state of fear. Even that funny voice that Cushing does. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem like an affectation. It seems like a legitimate character choice. Yeah. It is... A decent double twist at the end. Mm -hmm. As you said on the couch, I, I was fooled. I didn't realize what was happening at first. Yeah. Someone fixed his destroyed car. No, it, it wasn't destroyed. How? None of it happened. Oh, oh, look at that, man. The movie got you. But really, it's a triple twist. Because they do the false twist right at the beginning, where they show her talking on the phone to Sam and saying, hey, I tried to do the thing you wanted me to do and it didn't work. Yeah. And she's revealed to be a secretary and all that. So then you think immediately, okay, that's not going to be the story because they've mm -hmm. already debunked it. Watching Christopher Lee assassinate someone is a pleasure considering that he was an assassin during World War II. You or, often like to bring this up. Yes, I know. It's a fun fact. It is a very fun fact. Going and taking out Nazis, yeah. yeah. Somehow sneaking around at seven foot four, or however tall that guy well, is. And I think that's why he was so successful as a... Was he ever a Bond villain? He should have been. Yeah, oh, he was he's the man, man with the oh, golden man gun. man with the golden gun, yeah. Yeah, he's got that physicality that you see the menace, and mm -hmm. you see the capability of doing great violence. It reminds me a lot of the movie Sleuth. It's such a neat plot. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting and completely implausible. Yeah. Like, never, ever, 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 <laughs> ever happened. When you're confronted with that, you can only enjoy it so much if you're a thinking person. Yeah. There's... And I don't say thinking person in a condescending way. I mean, just someone who... Thinks about logic. We are to believe that the publisher was behind everything. Any scene that takes place without Desi Arnaz Jr. makes no sense at all. Nope. Sebastian and Mary and the catacombs or whatever. This is how you do it. Yes. You usual suspects the thing. Everything takes place from Kenneth's point of view. Things happen off screen. Like, oh, she's dead. She was boiled with acid. And then at a certain point when it's all revealed, then we see the behind-the-scenes machinations. Like, she's in the room, someone's putting makeup on her, she's like, hurry, he's coming! We or, have to make this quick, yeah. You know, rigging up Sebastian with the, the noose, and we show all that stuff. Like, that would be a really fun way to do this story. Oh, yeah, definitely. We talked about who could have done better than Desi Arnaz Jr., which is everyone yeah. on the planet, but who should have been cast in that role? Cocky intellectual. Mm -hmm. Okay, so who is that in 83? John Lithgow. Yeah. yeah. Also, he could have done the more broad stuff like his elders in the movie would be doing. The House of the Long Shadows is over. We've turned the light back on. And oh, look, there's Seen It. Seen It. Our Seen It theme for the second time this month is horror. Scary. 
Denise M. Faraday, seen it, 1983's The Hunger. It was directed by Tony Scott and co-stars David Bowie, Catherine Deneuve, and Susan Sarandon. One of the, my favorite underrated films ever made. Seen it. Seen it. I just rewatched it. I saw it when I was a teen. Uh-huh. It made my loins catch a fire. It is one of the sexiest movies ever. Because of that cast, for starters. Sure. Very sexy lesbian scene between Catherine Deneuve and Susan, Susan Sarandon. Sarandon. This is a really... Cool vampire story. Mm -hmm. No fangs, no bats, it just like regular people who live forever. You're not afraid for their victims, you're afraid for the vampires. Catherine Deneuve is an ancient vampire, and I get the impression that she's the only vampire. Mm -hmm. Because all of the vampires she creates are these imperfect creatures. Mm -hmm. They live forever, but they don't stay young forever, which means they spend eternity in a sort of living death. <sighs> God. She's a vampire in the double sense. She feeds on the blood of the living humans, but she also feeds on the love of these creatures that she tricks into this cursed existence. Yeah. Alan Fushigi writes, Freaky! It came out last year, and I don't think that many people watched it. Seen it. A variation on a Freaky Friday type story. Oh, I know what this... Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the people is a serial killer, and the other is an awkward teenage girl. Teenage girl, yeah. Young Catherine Newton does such a good job in the movie of just getting this demeanor. Okay, this is my body now. I can use this to kill people. And then on the other side, you have Vince Vaughn in the best performance of his lifetime. Wow. Playing a high school girl <laughs> who's madly in love with a high school boy, and there's this intensely touching, cute, and heartwarming scene as Vince Vaughn proclaims his love for this boy. We have a couple of DVDs that were sent to our P.O. box, and we're going to talk about them. First of all, I have got Hobgoblins. Seen it. Not seen it. Yeah, you have. You've seen this on Mystery Science Theater. Have I? I'm sure you have. I don't know. Made by a guy named Rick Sloan. No relation. This is an autographed copy Whoa. of the DVD that someone sent in. That same night, I started watching Houses of Long Shadows. Mm -hmm. Previous to that, I still had the urge to watch something scary and dumb. Yeah. So I put on Hobgoblins. I made it through like 20 minutes of it. It's too bad. You don't like the phrase, so bad it's good. And I, I get that. I think it makes sense. But this is just, it's not good. There's nothing good about it. And the worst thing about it is that every actor in this movie is the worst actor in this movie. If you said, put these actors in <clears throat> order of uh, acting talent, it would not have a column. Yeah. It would be a straight flat line like this. <laughs> How can every actor be so bad, even if you're casting people who have never acted before? It, I, it's, it's baffling. I didn't even make it to the Hobgoblins. I couldn't stand it that much. It's too bad, because I believe it was Ralph Richardson's final performance. <laughs> Another generous viewer has sent us a copy of Vincent Price and Diana Rigg in Theater of Blood. Seen it. Seen it. Edward Lionheart, disgraced actor, and his gang of murderous hobos <laughs> take revenge on the critics who have maligned him. Ten critics, all killed in specifically Shakespearean fashion. It's so fun. It's so twisted. Very, very gory. But the comedy is so solid throughout. Well, and the action, that fencing scene. And the murders keep topping each other. I'm like, oh, they got to do Titus and Ronicus. And once I thought that, I'm like, oh, I know who's going to be eaten. <laughs> yeah. I think Milo O'Shea mm -hmm. is a very intriguing actor. Every time I see him, I'm in love with him. He bears a strange resemblance to Keith Moon. The kind of crazed eyes. Mm -hmm. Hey, we didn't dress up in costumes this year. No, we didn't. Sorry, folks. Life just got away from us this I'm, month. I'm uh, Rock Hudson in uh, Pillow Talk. Doris Day in Pillow Talk. Uh, yes, I'm. That's right. You don't need to go to a House of Long Shadows at all, really. Uh, you can go to our website, welcometothebasementshow.com. All of our episodes are there. A huge back catalog of them. And there are PayPal donation buttons that you can click on and make a donation one time or rolling monthly to support our show. That's something that really helps us out in making this show. People do it. And Matt has an example of at least one of them. Peter! took the plunge, and became a monthly donor. Hey! Your show is one of my few sanity touchstones. I read an article recently on the rise of negative reviews on Yankee Candles because they have no scent. It made me think about a 2011 movie with Ewan McGregor entitled Perfect Sense. I thought then, then that the idea of a virus that took out the senses was pretty damn scary. 
it is. Have either of you seen it? I haven't seen it. No, and I'm not against a candle with no scent. Yeah, I'd rather just smell a candle. Mm -hmm. If you want more Craig and Matt chat, you can check out Unboxing, which comes out this coming Friday. Stories, surprises, opening mail, it's all there. All of it. And now watch this. While I was watching The Hunger, I kept having the Eddie Money song, Take Me Home Tonight. I was thinking, why? Why this? Why now? And then I realized that at, at one point in the song, he goes, I feel the hunger. <laughs> Roderick is still alive. <laughs>